In terms of education, what may be the best channels or best media for business owners who want to get more information about how to manage social media successfully? How do you think, what, what are the best channels for them just to get this information today? I really think brands need to kind of look at these up and coming creators because we're seeing them taking something that hasn't hit mainstream yet and over a span of a small window go, I'm not going to say the V word, but really expanding acquisition, expanding impressions and awareness in ways and then at a number rate of growth that doesn't happen as often. People wish they could have that. And so I would focus more so on creators and seeing how they're doing it. Because if a brand can match the cadence and flow, even the deliverability of their scaling up of the content for a specific campaign, oh my goodness, the, the brand is going to feel more human. And the data from the algorithm is already, they, the pathway has already been built. So it's just applying that in a second. Now, sure, if you're B2B, a lot of B2Bs are more resistant to more B2C strategies. But I find that the gap has shrunk so much now. There's really not that much difference. B2Bs are going to play by the same rules as B2Cs because they still have to reach the heart of the company, the customer at scale. Even if they're scaling to a business, when another business sees that this business has the heart of the community and the customers, they're going to be more inclined to work with them, maybe an acquisition, if that makes sense, or whatever might, the case might be. So I would focus more on the creators because they're doing the legwork for the brands and they're making it at a percentage scale without the tools and the resources that a lot of these big brands have. So I would keep a watch on that and make adjustments accordingly because they're going to be basically telling you what's going to make sense for at least the next three, six, nine months. I Digress is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. By shedding light on the stories behind the shiny resumes, social media highlights, and job titles, No Straight Path, hosted by Ashley Menzies Babatunde, aims to humanize success from the millennial perspective. Featuring guests from all walks of life, No Straight Path aims to inspire conversations around the nuanced perspective of success. How do you define success? overcome failure and endure life's unanticipated challenge. No Straight Path covers all of that and more. Recent episodes like Success is Maximizing Happiness, Finding Your Voice, and Success is Communal is all intent to help you see all the different layers it takes to be successful and what success really means in a modern era. Listen to No Straight Path wherever you get your podcast. What do actually businesses want from social media right now? I think right now they want social to serve as a mediator. Part active listening to seeing, because since the pandemic happened, they don't have a full assessment from the data pre-pandemic is irrelevant now. And so they're really trying to see where is our customers' biggest pain points are, where are they looking at, how does this match up to our competitors, where do we match up in the top of mind of our customers? And then the other part is between a combination of awareness and nurturing. Since a lot of paid advertisement is kind of shambles right now with Facebook doing a lot of the world meta now and modifications there, and a lot of their consumer base are much smarter and they're desensitized to ads. Social media is trying to fill all these voids all at the same time, and they don't know which direction to go. They don't know how to do it or where to do it. So do they ask you for some holistic digital marketing strategy that includes social media marketing strategy? Do you have some different approach to coming up with the strategies and different channels? I think it's gotten to a point now where you could, back in the day, you could apply a strategy that hypothetically would work on multiple channels simultaneously. Now it's gotten to a place where we almost need a social media manager per platform, or at least someone having a holistic strategy per that specific custom platform, because it's too micro. How you would approach video work on YouTube may not work with video approach elsewhere. Or a more linear example would be people think approaching the same stylistic way of Instagram reels will work the same way on TikTok or vice versa. In some cases, the data says it won't and the community says it won't either if it doesn't feel customly made or presented in that way to that particular platform. So I think some of the strategies now, it is challenging for a lot of social media managers. Also, we're dealing with burnout. So when we're creating the strategy, we have to consider, are these platforms even viable for us to even put in a lot of this effort? Because it's requiring like three, five times as much time and effort to research, analyze, create, let alone distribute at the right time in the right manners to hopefully get a type of result that we need. What's up, digital world? You're listening to the I Digress audio experience with Troy Sandy. Social media, marketing, storytelling, business, culture, and more. Coming to you in three, two, one. 
Can we say at this point that actually making the analysis of target audience can be of a huge importance today? So to understand what is the best platform, I guess the best way is to understand where the target audience for a specific brand is. What are their personalities? What are some behavioral traits? Where do they read the information? Is there like some kind of demand on this analysis right now, on target audience analysis, or businesses still try to do it, like ask someone to help them or just try doing it like others do? No, I, the data is helpful. At least in the past 18 months, two years, I find if you're at seven, eight figures, you're asking more questions or along those lines than if you're under. If you're almost, maybe you're pushing six or you're a little past six and below, you're probably not asking me that data as heavy, but it makes sense if your numbers, margin, your profit margins aren't shifting and swinging that much based off an audience persona. Uh, so I definitely get those questions a lot, knowing that data. And then we need the data to justify not only just the paid advertisement or social media side of it, but also just how how much in depth do we create the content for the organic side, at least from my experience. So yeah, it's important to really get that micro stuff in there. And how do you think, what are the best ways to actually get those insights into the target audience? So on social media, probably. You know, you need tracking. I think people still don't take advantage of tracking hashtags and tracking how people respond to certain trends. If you find the certain trends that align with your brand or your product or your service and impact in some way, shape or form, and even from a global scale and seeing how they respond to a positive negatively will influence how we're going to come across with our social media content, how we're going to position our messaging and where do we need to position and stand as a brand and distributing our content to a hopefully our target to do customers in the same way. I think sometimes we separate the product and service from how the customer feels. And I think since this pandemic, that we should double down more on how we feel. But the only way we can monitor and assess how they're feeling is if we apply the data in a certain way to show us that certain lens. Now, sure, the data won't show us every single thing of the human element, but we can have enough touch points to get a good idea of our audience is pretty mad right now. And these are the, probably the reasons why. Where does our positioning on our product or our service align with that? Yeah, that's, by the way, a great insight to analyze the trends that, that are actually related somehow to, to the potential target audience That's and how they interact with those trends. And how do you actually keep up with trends? I mean, there are so many trends right now at the moment and different social media channels, like on TikTok, there are like some specific trends on Twitter and other trends. It's such a big mess. How do you manage to keep up with everything going? Do you have some maybe tools or maybe some assistants who do this? I try to filter things out. So, you know, obviously Google Alerts will help plot different Google Trends, ask you, that's the people, different websites like that. It just kind of get an overarching view. I also do a listening technique where we may plug into Twitter and have certain key indicators to pull certain things from. And we can't monitor, like you said, we can't monitor everything on TikTok or if something is pushed from reels that's making a big wave and things like that. However, I've noticed that if we wait and we see the trend manifest itself on other platforms, that's a big tell because some of the trends are really meant for one particular platform and people took the effort to take that trend and apply it to the norms of a different platform. That tells me if someone or a group of people are taking that much effort to push it on a different platform and fit it that way, custom wise, that's something we need to take a big look at. And so that's kind of how we've kind of structured a lot of things. Like we don't have time or the resources or the budget to apply all these different accounts to all these different things. And then we have all this data and can't do nothing with it. I think that's the other part of it too. How much data is too much data to decide on certain decisions. But if we can use our competitors or our community's impact from their data to see a more filtered view of this is going pretty big because these factors would not have moved. These brands would not have mentioned this trend if it didn't get to this threshold. That now tells us we need to get on the bandwagon now type of thing. Because I'd rather be on it when it's like not at its peak, but it's moving up in the right direction versus either being late or too early. And you got to put all that seed work and it doesn't give you any ROI that you want. It's time to take control of your social media marketing. Stay organized, save time, and easily manage your social media with Agora Pulse's inbox, publishing, reporting, monitoring, and team collaboration tools. As the ecosystem of social media is constantly changing, constantly evolving, social media managers and their counterparts need a one easy to use solution loaded with powerful features to help them navigate the digital world. 
One tool for publishing, scheduling, monitoring, listening, and reporting. All inclusive. All your fingertips. With over 31,000 social media managers using this tool daily. Agora Post packs a ton of features on a unified social inbox, intuitive publishing, social listening, insightful analytics, and social media ROI where you can easily see what posts and conversations are driving sales, leads, and traffic. And that's without being a Google Analytics expert. With some of the best support in the business. Rated number one on Captera, number one support on G2 Crowd, 96% user satisfaction score, and a 30-minute response time. With that amount of support, an all-inclusive turnkey one-platform solution with some of the best pricing for growing teams, you can't lose. And as an exclusive for the iDigress podcast listeners, you can get two free months using the Agora Pulse tool for free at social.agorapulse.com slash find Troy. The link to the two free months, more information about Agora Pulse, as well as some key insights I've shared on Agora Pulse's social media Pulse community will be in the show notes. Businesses, obviously, they ask you to help them because they, in general, face, I guess, difficulties with social media and especially in in their target audience. But what about content creation? Do they actually provide you some kind of their content or do you create content on their own? What are their problems with the content in general? I find that, you know, you're looking at content, they're either very complex, they're confused in the process, or their messaging is very complicated to the end user. And so many times they come to me to kind of simplify the process and magnify the results of the content that they're creating in hopes it's going to be better distributed, but ultimately giving them ROI and the revenue they want in the long term. So it's different because the way we look at content now is different than even how we looked at content during the pandemic and pre-pandemic. The content that we were really pushing during the pandemic was more heartfelt. We tried to not make the sell look like a sell at all. And that has carried on. And I guess in many cases, you would say that a lot of folks will want that even the more, but we still need to see the numbers go up too. So it's been a weird situation, I, I think for a lot of creators, to create content that still checks marks a lot of the stuff off in this new world that we're in. And it's quite difficult. So if I'm looking at, you know, people come to us and we help them with their content strategy, we don't even really start with the content creation anymore. We do have to look at the data first because we only have X amount of time. We're under some crazy timelines and deadlines to get a certain amount of results. And so we really lead more with the data first and maybe how we were originally would be focusing more on the essence of the content. If the data suggests we shouldn't do it, we're probably not going to do it right through now because it's just everyone has limited resources and time. And after you've made a, like the analysis and you understand the essence of content in general and what will probably work better for the audience, what are usually the steps? So like, for instance, let's think about some specific post on Instagram. So you need like a photo, a text. Okay, the text is probably on your side, but the visuals, are they provided by business owners or they also ask you to come to help them? What, what is the best way for them actually to do this? How do you think? I think the best way now is to provide imagery. The days of just stock images serving you and making you millions are coming to an end. Sure, they still work really well to an extent and paid social, but on the organic side and building that community, really making that social five weeks, six months from now, still bring you some value is going to have to be their own content. Now, many times we may work with or partner or even suggest someone to do candid photos and different things like that, but we even, even more so encourage their teams and employees to just take the selfies, take the shots. It's going to feel different than a high quality image. It's going to feel more relatable and we can work with that. We can maximize the story and the narrative behind it more so. And But now we're becoming trainers of the content creators are trying to educate those who we need to create content for on how to give us these candid shots so we can therefore create the content. So our timelines are much wider. It has to require more patience. It may require more team members to intercede between that. So a lot of new challenges. But I think even though it might take longer or it might feel uncomfortable for a lot of these new brands, I'm not sure saying new brands, brands to adjust in this new way, I think it's going to make our content and just content in general better because now we get to see the faces of these brands and hear it from them versus hiding behind the logos, hiding behind kind of their prestige. They got the blue check. They got millions of followers. They should be set for life. That's not the case because TikTok disrupted all of that, seeing smaller brands and creators and small local businesses maximizing through the algorithm, understanding the data and just taking theirs, you know? So in the same way, I think it's taking and making everything 
more human, more relatable, less higher end, and just more higher quality in the receptiveness of how people see it. Would you mind doing a quick mental exercise with me? It'll only take a second. Imagine for a moment you're at work and suddenly you and your team are perfectly connected. I mean, perfectly aligned, 100%. There's no miscommunication, nothing falling through the cracks. You are totally 100% in sync, a collaborative, intuitive, and motivated force of nature. How does that feel? Pretty good, right? HubSpot helps you and your team connect so you can always be in sync. With shared access to the same customer data, you and your teams can see the full customer picture. HubSpot's powerful CRM platform powers you and your teams to officially collaborate and power exceptional customer experiences so you can scale fast together. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. I talked to one also digital agency from Africa and she told me that today it's great to make mistakes in content. So they make mistakes to just generate some like engagement, awareness and all this stuff. And that sounds very cool. So some business owners think that the content should be like perfect and everything should be like top notch, very beautiful picture. But in some cases, it's better to like be just authentic probably about speaking about the brand, about the business owner himself or herself. What's about managing the process of distribution, of content distribution? So I guess uh, you're not only the strategist and you also make posts for businesses or they do this on their own. So who is responsible for it? depends on the situation and how uh-huh. in-depth we are. In many cases, we're the ones creating the content or we're advising them kind of done. Is it, you know, DIY, DWI, DFY, you know? So it depends on what they need and what makes sense, especially if we know the language, we know their voice, we have a strong establishment, then we probably be more than willing to like run it and just speak on their behalf. But other times we want to just help advise them on how to do it. And in terms of advice, do you recommend them some kind of tools that help them to schedule and manage? Do you personally use some tools that help to schedule posts in advance, manage different channels and do all this stuff? Depends on the organization. You know, sometimes they just want everything done through one platform. So it's like, okay, if I can do this and that for some rush, something else, then that makes sense. Or maybe they have a certain preference of style of how they want to schedule the content on the UX UI side or a budget. You know, budget to me is the biggest factor. If you can't afford a real scheduler, I mean, Creative Studio for Facebook and Instagram call it a day. I mean, at the end of the day, your customer, they're all going to care about it. Does the content resonate? Now, sure, there is a slight decrease in reach and impressions if you're not using preferable native channels in some way, shape or form. But the trade-off of that is you're still going to make 3x, 5x, 10x reach and impact scheduling than you would trying to maintain an always on organic situation if you don't have the right team members in place. So there are some very like suggestions that could be based off our partnerships or you know how we see the value i think customer service and how we schedule our content new features so let's say for example like agora polls are very big on not only creating a space to train people how to use their platform but connect them to other folks that could be business that can help them educate on their areas too and i think that's a big feature thing so we're seeing a lot of these you know companies and organizations really give more value beyond just the schedule and it's just figuring out which one that makes sense for you as an organization and obviously your budget There are some free tools, there are some paid tools and some paid tools with very big amounts of different things that might not be useful for those clients as like social listening. And you as an agency, are there some tools that you personally use to manage social media of clients or your own social media? So what can be the like your benchmark tool that could be great for others? If it's a high end, they want all the data and they have the budget. I haven't seen anything that that compares to Sprout Social as far as just having everything natively. Is it a massive endeavor to learn everything and how to apply everything? Yes, of course. That, you know, everything that are sprinkler. But if you want to talk in mid tier, then probably the Agora Puzzles of the world, the buffers of the world, if you're mid tier. Because, uh, you know, if you're not looking at the data from all these different lenses, it could be overwhelming, overpowering. And I never want to suggest a platform to use, utilize it. They're not going to at least use at least 85, 90% of the features and options there for them. 
But then we also have to understand that there's different levels of people and how they see social media content creation distribution versus others. And so if they have a massive following, we were talking blue check, you know, millions and millions and millions, you might want to be more in depth and more robust because it's going to require you to be more active listening and being able to respond in a more pneumatic way with a bigger team members group versus if you're maybe a member of a group of two and a girl poll situation might be more better for you because it's just less noise, but you can still engage at a high enough level for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you personally use some kind of collaborative tools that might help you? Like if you have someone in the company who ne you need to approve their post or they need to approve your post. So how do you think in general collaborative feature of the tool is that important? I judge it. Honestly, I judge them by their mobile app application, because if I'm thinking my team or myself, not as much as we're used to right now, because we're not traveling as much. But if I think in the whole, just the realness of, I don't have to always go back to my computer to approve, you know, just having that full feature. And it's in a way that makes sense for my phone. That is a big luxury thing you almost need to have just for just the use case, the user experience of everyone on the back end, you know, because you don't want to be tied to computer for stuff like that all the time. But I've seen cases where they really dropped the ball in the UX. UI on the mobile application of approving and process something's mixed up you know time zones are all over the place and we can't afford that we only got a small window of review approval and keeping it moving if that's predicated on me not being on my computer that's that's a massive problem that is by the way a great insight because like i never heard such an idea because usually you know many people they give an advice that they should like check out some data analyze something like very specific related to their target audience but yeah just focusing on what actually works today from the creator's part that is i guess a great idea i mean not many strategies can be i guess adjusted and adapted to the specific case but anyways the, the general idea and what about choosing the the right platform how do you think like can businesses especially in b2b go to tiktok today and maybe to some other like maybe not that traditional platforms like linkedin or facebook or, or how do you think how how they can estimate potential value from like TikTok, for instance. I always tell anyone, you know, especially in the B2B space, that you might want to try a different platform that no one else is really on for years. Because there's too many examples of people who are fintech, lawyers, healthcare workers, industries that are pretty bland, that aren't socially whatever, that are having massive awareness and a massive growth by being on platforms and just sharing the most basic things. Even it may be more boring, it just lands with the community differently and it separates yourself from somebody else. And so I remember at one time, a quick example, I advised someone, well, you're trying to, they were doing LinkedIn every day for three years and they just saw a massive stump in their growth and engagement. And I said, well, how about you convert all these long posts into like one minute video series that you see on TikTok and use that to boost your brand awareness and keep your LinkedIn the same. And so we just basically doubled the effort, but just taking the content that we've already created and repackaged it for TikTok to boost awareness. And now they're not going to know you just for, you know, what you're doing on LinkedIn. They're going to know you for what you do on LinkedIn, but on TikTok. So now you're the TikTok lawyer or you're the TikTok doctor or whatever generic phrase that might be TikTok brand that sells this or sells that. Now you have such a high IQ of awareness here that when those who are serious are going to trickle back down to LinkedIn, you've already been validated. You're going to get a massive amount of more engagement. And so it could be just instead of always trying to make it seem like the platforms that you're adding on is secondary, it's really to TikTok has now become all awareness. And now LinkedIn is like a feeder for nurturing and acquisition versus seeing them as two separate siloed platforms all doing the same thing. We're now seeing people doing specific things on specific platforms to almost funnel them down the channel instead of having one social network of all the different platforms doing it all at the same time. And so that was a massive shift that I've seen. I'm seeing a lot of brands doing that. So I said all that to say when we're looking at what platforms to suggest, I strongly believe that it almost doesn't matter. If your audience isn't on that platform, but if your content creation distribution is good enough, you're going to attract people to consume your content on that platform specifically for you versus before well linkedin b2b this amount of money you're trying to make linkedin's it that's it that's the be all and that's i don't think that's the case anymore because we have to understand that since this pandemic a lot of the key decision makers and key customers are on all the platforms they're monitoring so it's like which one can i get to them versus my competitor and if i can get them through a more entertainment platform but subconsciously they're willing to buy my brand first when the top of mind when that comes 
that's a higher real estate value to me than waiting and just being on LinkedIn when they're coming from the nine to five, because I have their heart from seven to nine on the weekends and on the weeknights, and I'm getting more of the money and more brand awareness and acquisition that way too. That sounds like a great growth hacking process in general on social media. So you just try, you just come, try some special methods. There is no one who follows you, but in like in a month or so, you have already your, your followers and brand awareness. And that's a wrap. We hope you enjoyed this episode of I Digress. What was your takeaway? Care to share your thoughts and tag Troy on social media? You can find him on all platforms at Find Troy. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review or comment for this episode from wherever you're listening. Looking for a marketing strategist to build the structure, strategies, and systems you need to get the success you want and the ROI you desire in your business? Book a discovery call to talk with Troy at findtroy.com. And as Troy's philosophy goes, imagination is the engine, content is the fuel, social media is the highway, marketing is the roadmap, sales is the destination, culture is the GPS. Thanks for listening. Yeah.